Hi, I'm Pete and welcome to Just a Few Acres Farm. Today we're going to start cutting hay and I've seen a lot of videos on YouTube about making hay where it's basically a lot of driving around and very little talking. So I have a bit of a different approach here. I'm going to show you making hay from start to finish in a series of videos and I'm going to treat it like it's the basic beginner's course about how the equipment works, how you time it, when to do each part of making hay, and this is the first video. There's a lot of pride involved in making hay and knowing your cattle are fed for the winter and also a lot of stress. So I'll do some talking about that too as we do the work. First, let's talk about equipment. Buried under this pile of junk is a sickle bar mower that we used when we first started making hay. We hooked it up behind our old Super C tractor and uh, it did okay. But sickle bar mowers like this are difficult if the conditions aren't right. If the hay's laid over uh, or if it's too wet, they tend to clog up a lot. They sure are a joy to cut with. They're quiet when the conditions are right, but when the conditions aren't right, they're a real pain in the butt. Although we've moved on from this old mower, we still use old equipment and I buy old equipment at auction and that way I don't have to borrow money from the bank to pay for it. And I enjoy fixing it up, so let's see what we use now. A couple years into making hay, we started using hay binds instead of sickle bar mowers and they made the work a lot easier. There's a seven foot one back there and this is actually a nine foot cut one. They're both international 990s made in the early 70s and they're reliable old machines when you fix them up. I paid about a thousand bucks for this at auction. I put another three hundred dollars into it in wear parts and it's fairly reliable now. Let me show you how it works. Just like that old seven foot sickle bar mower that I started out showing you, this cuts with a sickle bar as well and that's the difference between a hay bind and a disc bind. Modern mowers are disc binds where they have a set of what looks like a row of little whirling lawn mower blades to cut the grass. This is more like a giant pair of scissors or a whole bunch of scissors in a row. So these triangular what they're called knife sections go back and forth between these rock guards and cut the grass. Now the big difference between this and that old seven foot sickle bar mower are that it has this reel which turns this way and pulls the grass across the sickle bar and helps keep the sickle bar from clogging up. The grass comes in at the right position to be cut by the sickle bar. Then the other big difference between this and that old sickle bar is that this actually has a conditioner on the back or a crimper as they started out being called. What this does is as the grass is cut it gets forced up between these rollers and these rollers crimp the stalks on the hay and that crimping makes the stalks dry out a lot faster because there's a way for moisture to escape from them. And all the freshly cut grass shoots out the back of it here and it piles it in windrows with gaps in between. The idea between that is the hay gets all jumbled up and fluffed up so that air can get through it. The whole thing is driven by the power takeoff on the tractor and one set of hydraulics which raise and lower the head. The PTO shaft comes into the machine into a gearbox here and then there's a belt drive which drives the reel and a chain drive which drives the rollers and another belt drive down in here which drives what's called the wobble box which makes the knife go back and forth that vibrates this way really fast. Okay, now on to the tractor. This tractor was also built in the early 70s. It's an International 656. It's about 65 horsepower. It's six cylinders, hence the 656. It is diesel powered. It originally came with a gas engine uh, when I bought it, but I found a diesel engine for it, and the diesel engine is a lot more fuel efficient, and it's just a lot nicer to run. I paid about $3,000 for this tractor at auction. I probably have another $5,000 into it in parts and engine repairs. So it's cheap horsepower considering what you'd pay for a new tractor. Now the thing that is super about this tractor for hang is that it's hydrostatic drive and it was the first large hydrostatic drive tractor. Hydrostatic is what a lot of little lawnmowers use now where you push down the, f the foot pedal and the more you push it down the faster it goes. It's the same with this tractor. You just move this lever forward here and you go faster and to go in reverse you go this way. So the reason that it's so nice for hang is because often in hang you hit a high spot or a low spot and you want to go slower or faster. With this tractor you don't have to push in the clutch and change gears, you just move the lever. Super for hang. Okay, now that you're familiar with the equipment, let's go out and cut some hay. 
The first thing we do when we get into the field is make the first pass around the opposite direction that we'll be mowing the rest of the field because we want the machine to get as close to the fence line or whatever borders the field as possible. We cut all the way around going in that direction and then switch and go the other direction. And the idea here is you don't want to be driving through wheel tracks that you've left on the previous pass. So only on the first pass do you make wheel tracks that you'll drive through later. Then from the second and third pass on, you're always cutting into the field and your tractor wheels are in already cut hay. The reason that you don't want to drive in hay that hasn't been cut yet is because it'll lay the hay down and you'll see it after you're done cutting. You'll see the rows of hay that didn't get cut completely because your wheels had pressed them down. This hay is over mature, but that's the way first cutting is around here. It just is too rainy and cool to get the hay on first cutting before you get some seed heads. And in this year, the orchard grass shot up and is at least three foot tall, while the other grasses are still shorter and haven't bloomed yet. After cutting in, the next job is to make the headlands. And to do that, I take four complete passes all the way around the field. This gives me room to work the aisle after I make the four passes so I can just cut two sides of the field after that, kind of like mowing a lawn. When I'm making the headlands, I cut square corners with the haybine, which is really slick that it can do that. Basically, you turn the tractor and the haybine kind of stays in place and turns at a 90 degree angle so you can cut all four sides. I don't do that after I cut the headlands because turning so sharply puts extra stress on the joints in the PTO drive line and you can wear out U-joints quickly that way. I love cutting hay. Our farm doesn't involve a lot of tractor work, so I get to get in my tractor satisfaction in the three months of the year that we're cutting hay. I love hearing the old machinery work. I love the feeling of satisfaction that I get that I took these old pieces of equipment that didn't really run very well when I started, and now they're reliable and they run great. But on the same hand, it's stressful. I have to drop everything when I get a weather window to make hay. And for us, that's a minimum of three to four days, depending on how hot it is out. And I have to get it done before it rains. When hay gets rained on, it decreases its nutritional value. And getting it rained on a little bit once or twice may be fine. But if you get a couple soakers while you've got hay on the ground, that hay's not going to be very good. But all that stress is worth it for me because having a barn full of hay is like having a shed full of firewood you have some measure of satisfaction that whatever happens in the world outside our farm, we have some measure of protection. We have our own stores of things to feed our animals and heat our house. So the stress is worth it, and I would never think of buying in hay for our cattle. It's just part of having a complete farm making your own hay to feed your own cattle. So when you add all this together, I don't get a lot of sleep when I have hay on the ground. And I often joke to Hillary that the haymaker's best friend is a combination of Xanax and Motrin. We do three cuttings per year on most of our fields. And the exception is fields that are heavily in grazing rotation where the cows eat quite a bit of the grass, but we still hay those at least once a year. About 75% of our hay comes from a big first cutting, and then the other 25% comes from the second and third cutting. Quality-wise, the cattle much prefer second and third cutting. It's more protein-rich hay, and it's a lot more tender because we can get it before it starts to go to seed. The top half of this field had been grazed once, so even though the orchard grass is going to seed, there's a lot less hay here than in the lower half. The lower half hadn't been grazed at all, and it's thick, tall hay, at least up to my waist. On the surface, cutting hay may seem pretty boring. You're just going up and down the field, back and forth, but there is no time to daydream. Cutting hay is truly living in the moment because every minute you have to have your eyes and your ears aware of what's going on. My eyes are looking at all the trouble points on the hay bind. Is the knife clogged up? Are the rollers wound up? Is the chain working correctly on the drive? Is the PTO all right? Is the hay flowing through it like it should? And my ears are listening for any trouble points as well because any subtle change in the sound that either the haybine or the tractor are making could spell trouble. And you learn to figure out what each little sound means. Keeping the knife and the rock guards in proper adjustment and making sure none are bent and everything is sharp is an ongoing maintenance thing with a haybine. 
One of the consequences if you don't keep up with that maintenance is you get a lot of clogs. You'll also get a lot of clogs with a hay bind if you're mowing in hay that's too wet because it just tends to catch in the hold downs and in the rock guards. If the hay bind does clog, and usually if it clogs it's only for a little section of that nine foot knife, you have to leave the head down, back the hay bind up a little bit so that the clog gets pulled out of the knife and then you can lift up the head, drive forward and drop the head and start cutting uncut grass again. This doesn't happen very often because the hay bind is now in proper adjustment. There's some tricks to working an old hay bind correctly. First of all, the thing to always remember is that the hay bind will clog up if you run it through grass that's already been cut with the head down. So on every row, I have to raise the head when I get to the headlands and then put the head back down as I cut into the next row. And it's so cool actually, I play a little game with myself. Can I drop the head at just the right time where it hits that uncut grass at just the right point? Little things like that keep me entertained while I'm cutting hay. After I cut into the row, I really enjoy seeing the hay bind start up cutting and to see the grass just start flowing through the hay bind. It's such a smooth motion when the hay bind is working correctly. When you get down toward the end of the cutting process, you inevitably wind up with a tapered middle section of the field because no field is perfectly square or rectangular. And getting that tapered cut is tricky because again, you don't want to let the hay bind plow through cut grass because it'll clog it up. So you have two choices. You can either float the head of the hay bind up a little bit to catch that little tapered cut that's not a full swath, or you can go really slow, drop the head all the way down, and cut along through both the uncut and cut grass. If you go slow, sometimes the hay bind will work it through. I prefer to drop the head because I like a neat appearance for the field at the end with no raised center sections of partially cut grass. We're in an extended dry spell, so after I cut this field, actually I went and I cut two more fields and have about 15 acres of hay down now. Cutting that much this early in June is uncommon for this area and having an extended dry spell like this. And it actually helps me out in the long run because we can only cut hay and make hay between about the beginning of June and the beginning of September. And I want to get three cuttings out of that, which means my second and third cuttings are about six weeks apart after the first cutting. In future videos, I'll show you tedding and raking the hay and then finally baling it and putting it in the barn. So thanks for joining me. Stay tuned for those videos and I'll see you next time.